Yeah. Let me kill, let me pause the recording. Yeah, okay, Coffee Compiler Club. This morning we're talking about scams on my elderly aunt, which we have stopped in short order. And, uh, and maybe compilers and language runtimes and garbage collections and typing systems and things like that. Um, I don't have any set agenda. You're all being recorded. It shows up on YouTube within a couple hours. Uh, you know, the only new news I have is I put in a sunshade on my office so my face isn't completely solar flared out. And uh, it works great. I love it. That's my, you know, my $20 Home Depot home improvement project for the week. And uh, that's it. I'm done with my spiel here. Whatever people want to talk about. Oh, no, there's another thing. I have news. I, um, I'm going to go to Italy in a week and a half for two weeks to go well because my wife wants to visit. I've been many times in a visit and she hasn't. So we're going we're gonna to do the tour of Italy. And, and I'm talking at a, a conference called PLIS, which is actually a virtual machine summer school. There's a bunch of grad students in an Italian castle in Bernat. Tino or Bernatoro, I never say it right. And I'm looking well forward to hanging out in an Italian castle and talking languages and compilers and runtimes. So that's that, but that means that next week's on, but probably the week and the week after will be off. That's all. Are all right, who wants to start? Your talk? Sorry? Are they going to be recording your talk? I assume so. But it's stuff that, that I've done here. So, so one of them is going to be the SSA thing. They thought that was a cool idea. One of them will be, uh, you know, high performance computing games from, I think it's, I call it from low levels, but it's really, it's, if you're looking like you're CPU bound doing some computing problem and you're using a modern garbage collector languages, you probably have another problem instead. And there are giant speed ups to be had to sort out the allocation costs. So some systems are, you know, are, 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 are performance limited. Not everyone's performance limited. Some are performance limited. Sometimes it's for IO and context switch. And, you know, you have 200 connections to the database per query without any local caching and yada yada. And some are CPU bound. I'm plowing through a terabyte log file looking for security threats. And I wrote it in Java and, you know, and then in that kind of case, I can say, yeah, okay, here's a 5x speed up for doing something stupid. So the, those are old talks I've given a lot. Well, not that yet. The SSA one has a new new set of slides and more reasonably targeted. So you guys have seen those. I'll, I'll doll them up and clean it up and set it up for grad student digestion. But it'll be what you've seen before. Yeah, well, the the detail about how you do function arguments I found interesting, and uh, one of the things that so I I implemented that and that was that worked fine, um, and then I was uh, giving some thought to how you deal with return values from functions, and I ended up wiring it up kind of funny, and I don't because there's no real guidance on this, and uh, yeah. what I ended up doing is wiring up the return value as an argument to the call. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, I don't do that. No, so uh, I, I I make a graph. I R. I have a return node. It gathers all the return values. So this control, which says reachability, I got to the exit of the function, the state yeah. of the, the actual return value you think about, and the state of memory, which is the other return that comes out of there. In the land of Java, I would also take a set of exceptions that you're throwing. And then uh, it's a node in the graph that produces multiple values. And like every node in the graph that produces multiple values, I have a series of projections afterwards that let you pick out which piece of the projection, which which projection of the tuple that you were interested in as a consumer of the return. So that's like a that's a just a phi. No, it's a uh, it's like an if node has a true and a false after it. So if produces two controls: one that says you went to the left, one yeah. says you went to the right. So it produces a tuple. So I follow with a projection, which is let me, it's like a labeled edge. A projection node is another way to label an edge in a graph. Yeah. That's all, yeah. all it contains. It's a node yeah. that has content pointing to one parent and a zero or a one. In the case of the return, it has an uh, uh, enum, which is uh, you know control memory and return value. It's actually zero, one, and two as the enum, but it's an enum, fine. And then um, when I'm doing, 
single single function computations, single function extension compilations, I don't really care for a return node. It's just the exit. So if I have a compilation unit and it's going to be one function only, then I have an exit thing, the end of the compilation, which is either return or it's a root node because it's also the parent or, the, or it's a stop node or something like that. However you want to slice it. Yeah. Well, I'm doing AA and I have multiple tiny functions that are all being compiled all at once. So the same compilation unit is typing across multiple functions. He needs to see multiple functions. I have a, a return node and a call node and a function header node. And that is actually a call prologue and a call epilogue node. So call node is two nodes. One's a call prologue, one's a call epilogue. And I could build their the epilogue is where the return node. value is coming into for the call node. So the call epilogue is where the return value gets wired into. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought about doing it doing it that way. Maybe that would be make more sense. If, yeah, it's only interesting if you're compiling more than one method in the same compilation unit. If you're compiling one method at a time and pre-cooking it down to code and you're done and you inline, you know, the one method is it has inlines. So it can be, you know, a large body with lots of shit in it. But it's one method at a time, you don't need this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I recognize that this is not this all gets eliminated if you inline. Yeah. So this is the non-inline case, which I thought I would do before I do the inlining. Yeah. So 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 what I'm I'm saying something a little different. If you're compiling one method at a time, inlines are not my camera won't get my chin here. Um, if you're compiling one method at a time, then the, the return is also the ex the exit of the compilation unit. And you don't need it as a separate. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, uh, I thought I was originally doing one method at a time, but then it seemed like the value numbering kind of works across methods as well, as long as you make sure that you select things, everything that you, everything that you pull in from a value number has to be have an edge into the 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 method. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so you're saying a couple of things that are correct, and one thing is you just started wrong here. So, <laughs> and, and the, the gist of it is still, if I have one method and I've inlined a lot into it in his inlines, then those inlines disappeared as functions themselves, and I don't care. And they value number in the one method. It's just like all the code was inlined together, like a macro assembler or a macro in C, old school C would just inline the function body. Okay. Yeah. Under that notion, you don't care about what method uh, uh, a piece that got inlined is in because he's in the one giant compilation unit that you just keep piling things in. And that's the technology that Hotspot uses and has used for 25 years and works really great. So I'm in a different zone where I'm actually compiling multiple different guys who may or may not get inlined and I want to do type analysis across them. So I need them as separable entities. Now I have things that are uh different functions with calls and returns to other different functions all in the same compilation unit value numbering works as well across them all and and you don't have to track where anything comes from because the global code motion that i follow this with always sorts that out right yeah 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 that's right that's sorry i realized i misspoke when i said that okay. but yes the global co code motion pulls the right stuff in um yeah, I haven't looked at this with things that flow kind of linearly through the background, like uh, memory states and I/O states. But I think that works anyway. Those it, it changes so, the value number. Yeah, the, yeah the, the, those guys take an edge that is the memory in and the memory out, or the I/O state in and the I/O state out. That forces them to single thread, and you don't get any value numbering effects out of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So, so it, it, there is a value numbering effect here. So I saw I was spoke here a little bit. I got to work on my camera shit all time. I dorked around when I was doing this. Ah, that's better. Right now I'll do this. Yay. Yeah. So you can get loads that common up because they don't produce a memory state out. They just take the loaded state of memory and then they can the they can bypass a store. And so when I do global code motion, I have to put in anti-dependencies at the last state, at the last state. But right before I do code motion, I put in anti-dependencies. Yeah. And then the, the code motion guy will sort them correct. Yeah. And, and one thing that screwed me up was I value numbered my um, phi's or so, oh. like the, the composes. Yeah. And then that caused variables to 
that had the same value to have the same node. And that yeah. went horribly wrong. But um, I fit. Um, I, I got them on my spies all the time. It's all good. Now you have a, so you have the split thing. In, in my version of FIs, every FI takes an input from a region. I throw them in the value number because I don't pay any attention, but they yeah. can't common up with anything except another FI at the same merge point, which is showing that I'm taking a, two variables under different names, but they're actually the same value. They literally merge X and Y here and X and Y there, and it's the same thing, so I can merge them at the merge point. It's all fine. Yeah, the, the problem that I had was when I came around the back edge of a loop, yeah, I would add things in and both like say I had uh, A and B are both zero coming into the loop and then I add one to A and I subtract one from B. I would end up with uh, both A and B having the value being add one and subtract one. <laughs> so it was like it ended up being like paradox like wrong. <laughs> Right, we should throw this in the code um, blocks because we can get specific here. Like I do value number all the time on loops, fees, fees and loops, and it's fine, it works. Um, and I get, you know, add one and subtract ones all the time. I mean, that's like standard array math happens a billion times. So yeah, this all works. And, and so something else is going on if you're getting an incorrect setup. Da -da -da. Somebody's like typing furiously, file open dialogue. Oh. Do you want to share the screen? I'm not looking yes. at this. Yes. Uh, do you want do you want to have well here if I do this, I'm are you want to have control on the on the dock here? I have the dock up with sharing, but oh yeah, I'm I'm in the dock. Um I'm not sure what to put in it. <laughs> oh well. And under you know, pick a code block and throw in an example where you have, like I have a stupid test case where I do games where I have multiple ads and shit. Although you want, what I heard you say is I have some variable comes in and I, and I add and subtract one from it. I'll throw down my okay. example in this here sure. code block for copy. I'm gonna cut and paste. And, and I don't know what example you're having a problem with here. But I kind of I fixed it, but I fixed it by not value numbering my my compose nodes. I still value number the select. They should totally they should totally value number fine. So there's something else going on here that I don't understand. <clears throat> other than you know capitalization is Google's brainless thing. So I wrote something here, something like you know a really simple little example here. Yeah. Right. So, so let me just change one thing. Yep. I'll do that. Oop. Yeah, minus, add another minus. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so let me go turn this into SSA form and we'll see what, what's going on here. So uh, da, 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 x0, y0, x0, x1 is a fee of x0, comma x2, which we haven't seen yet. Get rid of caps again, Google. What the hell, you can't write code. And of course, y1 is phi of y0 and y2. And uh, what do we got here? x2 is x1 plus 1. And you know, y2 is y1 plus 1. Yeah. And in here, I'm missing x equals 0 equals y equals 0, whatever you want to call it there. Okay. So now what happens here is, is value numbering says x, y, 0 are the same variable. x and 0 and y, 0 are the same variable. Yeah. Right? yeah. OK, so these two fees have an x, x y, 0 point and an x, y, 0 coming in. Yeah. And, and they have two different back edges. So they uh, have no value so, so yes, once they get their back edge, they're different. But my problem is oh. that while I'm building, they don't, and they're the ah, same yeah. fee. Yes. And don't. don't don't value numbering your fees until the back edge plugs in as an as an alternative <laughs> arrangement. It's the simplest as simple as that. As an alternative arrangement, throw in the back edge holding placeholder of a null. And during your value numbering, say, I found a null on a fee. That's a red flag. Don't value number now. I'm mid-construction. So when I do my value numbering during construction, when it gets to a fee, I don't run the value numbers. I make the fee. I don't call a value numbering call on it. Until until the package finishes it off. That's how I do it. I actually I have to have the fee made. Okay. 
because it's a Luke. It has so, some hidden cards. so that's really the only nasty case. And then after that, they value number fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So just like a special construction technology. That I, you know, I show the, the video easy SSA somewhere in there. I'm building fees and I say I have a yeah. back edge. I don't know yet. Well, the normal thing is when I build a guy, if he, he, he goes to a state which where he's being made, then there's a, a, a line that says he's done being made. He's now semantically correct. Then I people. Those usually happen back to back, except at fees and back edges and the region for the back edge as well. Right. Yeah. Now, you're being made. Oh, you're not semantically complete yet. And I don't call the people. I yeah. carry on parsing and constructing and people and everyone else. After I plug in the back edge, I say, yeah. now you're semantically complete. Now I people you. And in particular, loops like this where variables appear and are not actually used in the body of the loop, they, they get a fee during construction because I don't know yet. Yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah. So what? So one of the one of the interesting things that I did, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. It's uh, less optimal. Um, I don't do any of the back back edge construction until I've built the whole graph, and then I fill in a whole pile of extra edges in one very simple pass. And that um, I put in indexes to look up different things and all sorts of stuff to sort of flesh out the graph. But that Try like the goal is to keep the building code as simple as possible because there's like a lot of edges to put in everywhere otherwise. Yeah. So I was pretty happy with that, uh, uh, but it prevents me from doing any peepholing beforehand. I realized I had put in like one or two here and there, like I get a lot of extra fees and. Yeah, and I'm, I'm showing I, an extra fee. I yeah, build it, yeah, exactly. I, I build it and then I peephole it out as soon as that loop completes and the when the and I close the loop. <laughs> and I was doing that and it was screwing up my graph and I realized it's, oh yeah, I forgot, I don't have the back edges in yet. And so it doesn't see any users. And so it deleted all my fees and okay, then it's like, oh, I have to wait. <laughs> so I waited and now, now it works good. But uh, yeah, so it's okay. just like a kind of simplicity optimization in ex exchange for speed. <laughs> I don't care much that, that much about speed, just a little. Okay. Well, th this was done... If I heard you right, I, uh, I put those fees in, and it's faster than than being smart. I put those fees. Yeah, yeah in. no, I, I I put all the extra fees in. Okay. But I don't clean them up right away. I yeah, clean I, them up after I build the whole graph. The whole graph. Just because oh no. Okay. So for speed and actually for simplicity, because I people otherwise while I'm parsing. Yeah. So I'm I not doing any of that. As soon as, as soon as I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not doing any of that. So I end up with a pretty hairy graph. Right. But then the first pass, I can do all all of that like immediately after. Really, really nice. Okay. So, so for speed, it turns out if you people as you go and you've done everything else yeah, correct, so memory management, it it shrinks your program a lot. Yeah. And you can reuse yeah. that storage as later in the compilation, and it all stays hot in your L1, L2 cache. So it's it is faster yeah. to clean up as you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so my current theory is that even if I lose an order of magnitude of speed, I, I don't mind. You don't care. Yeah, fine. Yeah. So I'm just trying to like mi minimize, like minimize complexity everywhere. And so adding all the edges everywhere ends up having to be in more places. So because various places that build nodes and then they have. To... Yeah, I don't know. You, you might have a different layout. I, I found that adding <laughs> the edges was straightforward, and it didn't help me to do it later or earlier. So I added them. Mm -hmm as I complete, like, I basically yeah. am following more or less an AST that was spewed out in bytecodes. Yeah. And when I see the back edge come around, I just, at that point, I, I have all the information, I close all the, I have to close all the edges because I don't know where they came from. So when I hit the back edge, I close all the edges. Now, having closed the edges, I had a counter that said, how many missing back edges do I have? And when it was to zero, I then, people on the spot right it's fine i mean it doesn't so, so yeah i it's kind of funny like uh, while i'm building the graph i have pretty clear like early on in the compilation process a lot of my loops are like do times like do do 10 times loop 10 times kind of thing or yeah um, and then that ends up getting split out into a loop with a with a counter and all that stuff. And I'm 
Right now, I'm not uh, keeping track of that information, and and I ended up discovering the loops later. <laughs> um, but my thinking was, well, if I do if I do it if I do that kind of transformation, if I sort of take advantage of that assumption that you know. I, my back, my loop head will always only have one back edge that my my loops will be in this structure and this is how it like sort of an easy way to get my loop count information out and stuff um I'll end up being sort of limiting myself if I want to add like some other feature like if I want to add like um <laughs> early termination of loop or well like, early termination okay what you just said was I loops have one back edge I, you have no uh you have no nested loops of the shared header. Yeah. And also the other big one is irreducible. I have loops with multiple entries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought that it's probably best to discover this stuff later from the graph. So like I have, you know, I, I was from your one of your one of your earlier papers, there's, you know, how you get loop nest and dominator trees and stuff. So I implemented all that stuff instead of trying to like do it with assumptions. Right. I, I uh, was handling the general case, which you totally get in Java. You get go-tos. And yeah. it turns out that try finally blocks force loops be irreducible pretty directly themselves. So they happen billions of times. Like, like any large guy who's doing try catch finally crap with file handles and opens and closes and IO things in a loop immediately hits irreducible loops. Um, yeah, I do all the pattern match for the loops directly. Like if you don't care about irreducible loops and you think they're uncommon in your scenario, you don't have to pattern match for them. The irreducible loops will fail to look like a clean counted loop. Clean counted loops have a very obvious pattern that you can pattern match on totally. And, yeah. and and now you can declare yourself, I have a counted loop, and then you can go to town on a counted loop. Yeah. 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 So my current theory is to try and figure out from the, even though I could put that information in earlier, if it turns out to be too hard, I might just put the information in. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So so um when you're so back to the call sites yeah yeah um when you're um so say you're not going to inline a, a call then mm -hmm. um you do wire the re it seems like there's value in wiring the return value from the call into the if you're call doing anal right, so if you're doing analysis across call site boundaries, which yeah. Hotspot does not do, which AA does do, then you need to wire them up. If you are living with what Hotspot gets away with, you don't need to wire across call site boundaries. You don't need to analyze across call site boundaries, so you don't need to wire across call site boundaries. Okay, so for Hotspot, you don't wire the return value into the call site at all. Huh. How does that interact with FFI? Okay, so in, in uh, so for FFI foreign function interface, I have a call. Now I have calls in the in the in the hotspot IR. There are calls. They take all your standard inputs. They have a tuple output. They have you know control memory and your argument pile, and they return control memory and a return value. And turns out they also have a series of controls for exceptions you can be throwing. Okay. So you have a node for the call and you have a bunch of tuples afterwards that say these are the following things that come out of it. What's the call call? I don't know. I don't care. Right. I have something token that tells me what I'm calling that came in as one of my arguments. It's usually a constant, but I, from the compiler's point of view, I don't know what I just called FFI or another piece of Java code or whatever. So when I'm calling FFI in the implementation details, there is a wrapper that wraps the FFI to make it safe for calling from Java code, including saying things like, hey, you're leading managed code. The garbage collector can't crawl the stack in FFI code. So I have to label the stack as being 
probable by the GC in case, SS, in case the FFI blocks, and I have to therefore lock, uh, uh, to require my own self stack lock when I come out of the FFI in case the garbage collector owns the stack lock because he's busy mutating the stack out from under me. So I set and I set the stack as freed and give a, a crawl point and I reacquire a stack lock, which is just a CAS instruction coming out of the FFI. The arguments in Java are passed around using the Java calling convention, which I have total control over, so I can shuffle registers freely. However, I de declare I'm going to use a calling convention. I'm calling FFI, which is probably using some sort of C ABI, and I must honor the C ABI call, so I have to do an argument shuffle there. In particular, on x86, there is a, a, a version in time where you must have shuffled float args from the standard x86 regs, which were being used because you might be calling printf to you know, pass float args in EDX or whatever the hell, and then in Java always pass them in the float registers because he could, because he knew he wasn't calling printf. Um, so there's a wrapper around FFI that makes it safe. So calling FFI, from my point of view, it looks like calling Java code, and the wrapper hides the fact that it's not Java code. That was another question, too. Does that answer your question, Aaron? Everyone's quiet. Yes, that answered my question. Okay. There was yeah. another question about calls that I missed. Two were asked in short order. <laughs> Um, fine. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'll well, think about it in a minute. Far away. Just think about FFI now. <laughs> oh, you were going to say, well, no, you kept bringing around if I have, uh, oh, here's Lynn. I haven't seen him. Oh, around. well, well, uh, you know, I guess uh, the question we were sort of talking about uh, optimizing across call sites. Right, right, right. Okay. For I hot think I want to. For hotspot, I just inlined. If I thought I wanted to optimize across the call site, what I really wanted to do was inline the call. Yeah. Um, and how do you, how, so when you're inlining, I guess, how do you deal with uh, things that end up being mutually recursive and stuff? Oh, I have a counter. Uh, okay. so you, you might inline oh, them yeah. recursively a few times and eventually you realize why well, I'm getting too deep and you just the inline heuristic counts and says how many times in a row he wants to inline like for really trivially inline uh, really small things that are mutually recursive or recursive or whatever that the, you inline and you blow up and you get big enough and you say stop this is stupid but if they're too simple then they completely eliminate and then you never get too big so you would just infinitely inline and the compilation never ends because you're just always inlining and then completely folding up the empty code and inline again. So there's a yeah. counter that says, I quit now. Is there a, is, is just sort of thinking about this a bit, is there a, a possibility to say, oh, I see um, say three functions that are going in a mutually recursive loop. And so it's like A calls B, B calls C, C calls A and it goes around and around. Yeah. Um, like to well, basically totally. inline yeah. those together into one function and yeah. then, but then call that. And then, cause then you could turn that into a loop and stop taking stack, right? Like right. as soon as you've got. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're, you're almost there and hotspot almost does the same thing almost. So I totally have heuristics in the hotspot that said, and oh, look, here's a repeat. Let's go ahead and at least make it to the repeat point. And the counter said, I saw A so many times in a row, but if A in line B in line C in line A, then then I got ABC before I saw A again. And then I went ABC maybe a few more times. It's basically loop and rolling on another name. What then happens is that you get them all together, but they end in a callback to the first guy. Turning that into a loop is tricky because it has to have tail recursion. And if you're going to throw an exception, you have to give an exact stack crawl in the Java case. Oh, uh, yeah. So you, you, it's not legal by, not quite illegal by the spec. It would be legal because stack crawls are always a best effort in the spec. In reality, if you blow a stack crawl, people would scream bloody murder. So and if you started out life where you're willing to throw away the recursion count or, or only give the recursion count, but the in-between variables and a tail recursive call are, are, are lost. So A yeah, calls- a, you call factorial, right? So just, just skip the mutual. A, you're running factorial. 
So, you know, you, you say if X is zero, return one, else return fact of X minus one times whatever. Okay, it's not tail recursive. So you can't, you can't do it. If I had a tail recursive thing or I could shuffle, I could do, you know, the, the obvious uh, 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 reassociation because multiply is associative and make it tail recursive, then if somebody took an exception in the middle for whatever reason, that stack crawl would normally have, I have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and I throw an exception, you know, on the stack variables. If instead I gave you, and here are five elided stack frames, and now you're at frame three for where you threw an exception for whatever reason, would that be acceptable? I, I claim in a modern new language that didn't have any history, people would be fine with that. You're doing recursion, you lost it in between states. Uh, they're all the same other than you count it down until you hit some limit and then you're going to count back up as you went back out. Except and it's not only it's not only about exceptions. Uh, in Java world, if you need to de-optimize, now you need to reconstruct all the frames in between. Well, the, what do you the put actually, that's a good point. I had this worked out before I left Sun. Like I knew how to do this. I'm trying to think of what I did there because totally there's a thing there. Like if you can do it in the first place, meaning your tail recursive, you can have some limit or rule on how you unwound that was reasonable because it, the unwind had to be empty. So what, saying, when, I, when I thought about no. it. The, OK, I, I'm sorry. Say, say again, Arthur, but, I, but I figured out what the, what the issue is here. There is not a problem. So let's, let's, say, let's say in this recursive function, you have a point where you can de-optimize. So now when you are um, doing this like recursion to loop conversion. And, 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 and you're only doing it with tail call, tail calls. Yeah, but before, tail, no, no tail let's, calls. Let's say, before the, let's say before this tail call, there was a deal point. Yes. Uh, now, on every iteration of this loop after the conversion, your deal state should actually include extra frame. All right, the, the iteration number. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I understand. However, as you proceed forward, you would only, uh, I suppose you then proceed to forward to the interpreter. Suppose I put a, a bogus frame on the stack that said, and here lie 17 frames that I didn't bother to actually put in. And then I went on an interpreter and I said, you know, go, 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 frame, 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 frame. Oh, I'm actually done now after the DOP point. Return, yeah, return, then... return. I hit my bogus 17, which Unwind 17 frames that have zero effect, guaranteed have zero effect because they're all tail calls. And then unwind, mm -hmm. unwind. So you couldn't <clears> ever. Yeah, they can have zero effect, but you may not be able to materialize those frames because certain functions are only one way. Uh, uh, so, for example, a modulo. You yeah, you can't materialize the frame. I'm saying. Right. So, I think what Arthur is saying is that in DOPT, he always materializes everything as if right. it had not been optimized. And I, if you I, have I, a tail call recursion that passes, say, a modulo down to the next call. I'm, 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 I'm there. I mean, I understand. I'm, I'm saying like there if is no semantic the, meaning to those frames. If you interpret no reason the JDM the has to let you block or breakpoint in them because there's no work to be done because they're all tail calls. So it's the as if rule. You but then you need to. Be, you need to support this in your interpreter. You need to support basically tail call optimization in the interpreter. You need to recognize this kind of frames. And yeah. then, yeah, maybe. I, yeah. I claim it would be possible to stick frames on the stack that were essentially empty and count them as many as I needed to right. make it completely interpreter friendly. They just wouldn't have any interesting state in them because well, but, you can't uh, breakpoint at them anyhow. So let's I would really want them to not be completely empty, but to at least say, "Here is the list of functions that are in the elision." What, let, let's say, let's say you pass, let's say you pass uh, the the index argument. This this will turn into the induction variable once you turn it into a loop. Yeah. But if if your interpreter does not have any cooperation with this optimization, now you need to reconstruct. Like you need to have the value on each um, in each frame. The, Separate out the go forward from the go back, right? If I'm if I'm executing code and I know that I might deopt, I always carry enough information to feed the interpreter. He can go forwards now, not unwinding the stack. Just he can carry on the calculation from here. 
and that in general means that the D opt info already contains. Uh, okay, so, uh, so you're saying you're, you're saying okay, got it. I think you're saying that all the values of these intermediate frames they will be there. Like yes, we need to have a value, but we don't. Uh, we, we won't use it, so it is dead. So we can put anything there. Like it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But yeah, if I'm if the interpreter was going well, to roll through a series of frames doing returns for he had a, a, a call instruction immediately followed by a return because it was, you know, tail calls. So the frame had to appear from the interpreter's point of view, but all he did was do a return again. Then he never actually looks. So I could fill those <clears> frames <throat> with zeros, for instance. But in fact, I could put on bogus frames that contained only you know, a, a, the, the smallest possible interpreter frame and all it was doing was doing a return. I mean, the, the thing to remember with a tail call recursion is that these functions, the current functions frame goes out of scope before the call actually executes. Yes. And so yeah. Arthur, yeah. from that point of view, it's, it's as if you've zeroed out the frame that they exist, but they're zeroed out, uh, kind of like you can't show them in a debugger like that's yeah. the only that's the only thing you lose is the ability to to click in the debugger on a previous frame and see what the value was before you before you called the next one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, that that makes sense. So th there is a value, but it's uh, it's that as it's not used after after we right. resume execution. Okay, and and then there's another there's another little from there. There's another little subtle gain we get, which is all the interpreter can do is call return instruction. And he only needs to do that once. He doesn't need to do it 17 or 10,000 or 100,000 times. So I really could only put, I could, I could get away with putting in a frame that was just, and here's where you're gonna return to. And the only thing that would change would be the stack crawler has to identify that this is the, 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 the placeholder frame for a thousand other frames. And, and we have one more bug here or, or case you have to handle. And that's, because tail call strips the frames out, I, I will not stack overflow where a, a naive interpreter would totally stack overflow. Correct. And so if I unpack to actual frames, I might end up throwing stack overflow at the DOP instantly. And this already happened in the testing 20 years ago where the interpreter frames are large, the jetted frames were small because they knew there was no work to be done, but they weren't tail calls, they were actual frames, they're just small. So if you turn the compiler off, the test case that said, go to the end of the stack frame and test stack overflow conditions would blow up at a certain point. If you ran the compiler, and, and the interpreter would trigger it. If you turn the compiler on, it would run to the end and not throw an exception for stack overflow because the frames had shrunk and you could fit, fit 10 times as many frames on the stack because they were 10 times smaller. So the QA guys come and yell at you because you're not throwing stack overflow. And in fact, there was no stack overflow. And they had theories that said, oh, there's a finite count and we know what the count is. And the answer was, they didn't know what the count was. They thought they knew what the count was. They didn't know because the stack frames had different frame sizes than the interpreter frame. And in general, they're much tighter. After all the inlining happens in the, in the JIT and he does all his stack optimizations as part of the normal register allocation shit, Usually my stack frames were 2x, 10x smaller than interpreter frames. They're much smaller. And that meant your stack overflow point was different. So the QA guys went back and sorted it out eventually. They, they got a better, smarter test. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll hit this game where I want a DOP. Oh, I can't fit it on the stack. I'm going to have to do the semantics as if I deopted and immediately do a stack overflow with no other way to catch it in between and immediately unwound the stack throwing all those things that you couldn't actually catch until I can actually finish unpacking stacks on the frame. So, so does that mean that in the JVM, there are cases where you'll get a stack overflow, but only when you're warming up? Um, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, certainly that's what the QA yeah. guys wrote in, tests for. In theory, in theory. Yeah. In theory, the QA guys wrote tests specifically that would do that, yes. So, so because basically if you go straight into something recursive without sort of warming it up and it hits the stack, boundary yeah. in the interpreter before it gets to JIT it. Yeah. Then so the JIT has a known kick in point, 10,000. I don't think, I think it's still 10,000. It hasn't changed in 30 years, 25 years. Yeah. The interpreter has larger frames. If you made a method of sufficiently small optimizable size, the frames are much bigger than the interpreter. 
and you immediately call it straight out of the go, you might get a stack overflow, except that usually you run, your frames aren't so big that the, you don't get 10,000 iterations and then the JIT kicks in. And then now your frames get much smaller and you get a lot more. So, but you still have a big stack in the background versus a smaller stack if yeah, you. But you can tweak the stack size. So right. If you don't tweak the stack size, and it's whatever the limit is now. I don't know. It's like one meg for Azul. It's like two megs because it was a TLB boundary or something. There's some one or two meg limit, and you get ten thousand before the JIT kicks in, and your frames are for the interpreter are like two or three words for the return and and your local variable incrementing or whatever. Not too many. You got to figure, you know, two million divided by four words. I, I got to get, you know, five hundred thousand in. I'm never going to overflow. For yeah. the but it's by the way, you know, like frame on the interpreter, which has a huge count of registers that don't somehow all get stacked yeah. on top of each other because Java C will do that. So I make some junk dead code with a huge count of different registers. The interpreter frame gets giantly big. I get a, a kilobyte of interpreter frame. Now I would go 10 megs to get a thousand in or 10,000 in. So after a thousand frames in, I ran out of stack and I stack overflow to the interpreter. Yeah. And then I can so like, tweak in between. 10 or 15 years ago, I had like one or two gigs of memory on my machine. Yeah. And I I set my stack size this like to whatever it's set to. And now I have 10 times as much memory on my machine and I think I still use the same stack size, but is that stupid? Like, should we have 10 times bigger no, stack? No, here's the deal. Your stack frames probably aren't any any terribly bigger in the last 10 years. When but I'm just saying that out, like, stack frames look like what you got out of a C machine with a little bit more. And the 10 years after Java came out, people get huge amounts of accessors and wrappers and factories and shit and stack frames balloon. Yeah, average size or count of things so that you would get hundreds as opposed to dozens out of a C program, a large C program. You got but hundreds. every now and then I write something which is valid, it just blows a stack. And we also and went from, go uh, and change it. We also went from 16 bit to 32 bit, and 32 bit to 64 bit in a fairly short period of time. So that, and, in yeah. some ways, in some ways, doubled and quadrupled the. Uh, the frame sizes. Yeah, it, it grew the frame sizes. Uh, the I think the 30, 32, 64 didn't, because Java ints were not as much, not as much, right? Because yeah. most of the pointers were still compressed and so on. But it 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 will have grown it for a lot of languages, not Java so much. So so like for instance the the you know there's no tail calls in Java, unfortunately, and no, the there's no tail call matching optimization. Yeah, the, the, you can write shell calls. Optimized. The JIT can see them. There's no optimization. Well, yeah, they're not optimized. So therefore, you know, whatever. So, but, uh, you know, the pattern matching system that I built, that I built my whole compiler on, uses continuations. <laughs> right. And continuations suck for stack consumption because they just can forever consume stack if you don't. That's because you're running tail or enclosure. <laughs> Compilers well, do a lot of recursion. Pattern. I mean, I do a lot of recursion algorithms in when I write compiler. Every so, time you know, know there's a simple there's a simple solution for it, right? You just build a trampoline, you throw the you throw the continuation function down a few hundred stack frames and right. then carry on. Right. So what I normally do then is I say, I don't need a trampoline because I'm going to be smart about it and not do it with continuation and life is <laughs> oh, and wow. Archer can probably explain to you what they're doing on the JVM for the um the relocatable stack stuff where the uh, they only take a few frames from the stack and move them over and then put a uh, some sort of guard you know what i'm talking about arthur it's, it's been the last within the last couple of years they i think it's related to loom yeah yeah oh loom sure what's sorry what's that it's good like green threads uh yeah, but, virtual, yeah. Virtual, virtual. Oh, loom is a technique for dealing with lots of threads in an automated way Right, yeah. but continuations is the sweet spot for it because you can have a billion continuations, each of which has a megabyte of stack, and it uses a total of eight k or whatever. I mean, it's a it's a ridiculous. The continuation doesn't need any stack. It doesn't need the unused portion of the stack. It only needs the. That's used. right. 
that. Does it? Oh, it doesn't. Really? It doesn't just need it on the growth side. It also doesn't need it on the previous side because they put a guard there. So as you return up, there's a yeah. So they can kind of reconstitute the stack as necessary. Yeah. So you're, so you're saying, saying I should go. To. I should expand this whole pattern matching system to use Loom in, in the back end instead of just regular functions. That sounds uh, I just scary. do it with C code or with Java code and no no continuations. It's all good. Yeah. Well, you know, I get a, I get some pretty cool functionality for you know the the the. the it's right. a pretty powerful system. I'm actually going to be giving a talk at uh, at this thing called London Closureians now, about this pattern matching system. Throw a link in, and you're going to have Is a talk. Is this different than the Closure Async Library? Uh, what I'm doing, yes, it's not an async library. It's a pattern matching library. It, it's on my GitHub. It's called Pattern. Uh, sure. and I can throw throw a link. Eric, throw a link in. I'm I'm curious. All right. I'll put a link to my project first. The documentation's not very good yet, but where is the talk going to be? It's going to be on this library. It's going to uh, and it's at a group called London Closurians. I will have to find the link to that. I'm just wondering uh, where they're when, when is it going on? Is it going to be uh, Italy? In November first. Yeah, I haven't back. started working on the talk yet, but good, November first. Fine. It'll be recorded, so. Yeah, so yeah. I don't embarrass myself. No, I would, I would, I would just go so I can talk shit to Closurians and they can talk shit to <laughs> me. Be entertaining. That would be great. Not, not necessarily. Yeah. You should be happy. Hey, it's taking it's takes great advantage of the JVM. It's uh, oh yeah, no 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 no. Right? It's all it's all fun for me when all kind of alternative language starts showing up and. Suddenly, all my assumptions of what code looks like were all thrown in the, you know, thrown under the bus, and go go rethink how you think about code and shit like that. Oh, but yeah. usually these new languages produce more fluffy code and more optimization opportunities. Yeah, but different ones. So you have to go yeah. look at the compiler and decide, hey, I gotta need more inlining now, or something, or tail call elimination, or something. Well, the challenge is is when they're when they're building code. For the JVM, the, the, the JVM has instructions designed for one language, which is Java. So it's, it's, yeah. it's not so much that they're fluffy; it's that they're having to use very large hammers to squeeze their functionality into the Java bytecode. Yeah, there's and then there's that a lot of the JVM goodness came from its Smalltalk origins, not just the uh, Java. Well, that's interesting. Certainly Wasn't when I started, and a mix or whatever that uh, was self. it was self, it was, it was a self VM, but we but it, there were a lot of a lot of inspirations. Code. Yeah, we started with the source code to self, that was the runtime. It was a C anamorphic was the startup doing a self implementation for industry. Sun bought it, had a C version of self, they hacked in a bytecode parser and a class file, class format loader. But two of the guys at Anamorphic had apparently originally started building a Smalltalk VM and then gave up and switched it to self or something like that. But yeah, yeah. Was, and I'm gonna say Craig Chambers was the driving force for getting getting that going. I want to say that my memory is so small bad. Talk that I remember. Was, yeah, self was basically small. Was that not Peter Deutsch? Um he was not ever a part of Anamorphic. Yeah, um, he, I'll uh, spell Anamorphic. Whoever's writing Anamorphic, I'll write it. That was yeah. Long Beach LLC, right? Oh, there you go. That's the right way to do it. Um, I have no idea what the company was an LLC or not. Peter Deutsch was nowhere in sight. It was a bunch of grad students of Craig Chambers who then became Sun employees that I worked closely with for a couple of years. Hmm. That looks like the right smelling. I has been so long since I looked at Anamorphic. It might have been. It might have been A N I, not A N. A, I guess there's an interwebs question. Which you is, know, anamorphic was important to the history of computing because they came up with the whole cat dog animal example for object oriented that. Cameron's favorite animal, which has done more damage to object orientation than, than 
<laughs> everything else put together in the history. Yeah, but the company was named Anamorphic. It was great. Somebody has a suggestion. No, I don't think this is right. Okay. Google likes the spelling with an A there, but I don't know that I like it. I'll go look it up in a minute here. Uh, okay. Are we shifting gears? Oh, we could. You know, oh, okay. We're, we're speaking of a change, oh. uh, I think like uh, some time ago, I talked about uh, x86. It only has a fencing atomic add. In the most recent uh, update to the instructions, that they're actually adding the non fencing atomic add. Yeah, oh, so, I so. argued for that forever. I got one out of Zool and I argued it forever from the to the JVM crowd. Mm -hmm. Yep, they have non fencing topic yeah. add yeah. and for XOR performance and yeah, yeah. It's, it's like incredibly useful for performance counters that don't suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what does also have like a, a, like a read and write here. MSR list, which is kind of crazy? I never thought you'd need something like that. But... So, so, for other folks who don't know what's going on here, the fencing for performance counters, if you use a plain add, and you saturate the ad across multiple threads because you spawn a bunch of threads to do some big compute job. The counters all saturate at one update per cache line mess. They become extremely expensive from an x86's point of view because you ping pong the cache line back and forth. And because they are saturating, they're dropping counts furiously. And in fact, they drop like 99% of all counts and the numbers become equal in code that has widely varying control flow pass with different frequencies, the numbers all flatten across them all because the counters all saturate, which means that you can't have the jet look at the generated counters and get useful frequency information about what's hot and what's cold. They're all numbers are the same. They're all say, I, I update 10,000 times a second because that's as fast as I can ping pong cache lines and across all different counters and all different cache. So you lose distinguishing information. So if you switch to an atomic ad with a fence, then the counter update is hideously expensive because a fence on an x86 blocks all kinds of code motion and he's so fast otherwise that he, he, he can't do any of his fast tricks in the presence of endless fencing instructions. So you really want an atomic ad that is not fencing um, and you'll pay some amount of costs to do in, in, the, in the interpreter and the C1 jet, first tier jet you'll pay that cost of slowing down things to have a line ping pong in exchange for not dropping counts. And when you get to the C2 version, you drop the counter in, or you use the Laris ball fancy counters and, and you get you know super fast code and correct profile data. But you need a non-fencing ad or else you make the x86 suck really badly or you have really bad counters, take your pick. <laughs> Your C1 code slows down by a lot. To drop in an additional fence to use a CAS as a lock. I'm sorry, say it again. Is CAS fencing, or do you have to add in additional fences to use CAS? No, CAS is fencing. CAS is fencing. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of by you want a non fencing right? CAS also? Because, uh, because CAS, I, no, no, no. <laughs> so CAS, CAS is by definition fencing because it's. Uh, no, 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 no. No. X86 CAS is fencing. Azul CAS is non fencing. You can ask. Also, them. ARM that has non fencing CAS. You right. can like specify the memory order. Yeah. yeah. So you can have a compare and swap, which will do an add, an atomic add without any fencing on an Azul box. And then you add fencing in. They're separate things. You, you, you choose what you want. Pick your poison. X86, you get both or neither, but you can't pick one or the other. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, certainly there are hard ways you could. I've one never seen it. that. That's interesting. I'm trying to imagine how it would, how it would go. Well, so, so, so there's atomicity and then there's a uh, ordering with respect to like your local in instruction stream, right? So ARM has like CAS and then CAS A and then CAS AL. And... Yeah. So, so you have issues like if I want to lock, I want to not have a load that comes after the lock move above the lock. I have to have a, a, a load fence as part was, of the CAS. Wasn't but this a separate instruction that just follows the CAS? Wasn't this akin to the JVM put order at int, just just enforce without the fencing? Hey, see, Arthur. So say uh, say again, Jitter. 
put uh, doesn't this akin to put order it in to mean the unsafe uh, operation of the JVM? So the uh, yeah, unsafe picked up a bunch of private ordering, but they uh, and they picked up a weak CAS. I eventually got Doug Lee to put in a weak CAS for which x86 doesn't have implementation, but Azul did. So I could use weak CAS to do weekly updating counters like this, except the Java implementation of x86 couldn't actually do it. Yeah, we're getting into like super diminishing returns into like new instructions because they added uh, they added an instruction to read multiple uh, MSRs at once. So you can read 64 like <laughs> And then like right up to 64, which is kind of crazy. Who needs that? Who's writing MSRs and reading MSRs so often that you need? Yeah, uh, MSRs being the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The model specific registers or something. Previously, yeah, you had to do no, those no, one no. at a time. There's an if instruction. I wanted to do yeah. high performance computing and I'm trying to diagnose some performance in code that's going to run across all cores billions of times, which I wrote that code for H2O, but other people did. Everyone who's doing any kind of machine learning falls into this camp. You want profiling data there on x86. Getting at the hardware counters for profiling is, has been traditionally super expensive. Yeah, yeah. Like on an Azul box, I had a one clock, one instruction go read something that was a hardware counter. And I, man, x86, you had to switch to kernel mode to go read them and all kind of crazy shit. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a performance uh, for a security problem there, but. There should be a way to get at performance counters from user mode without the context switch overhead, which meant they're basically unusable for a hotspot. So hotspot yeah, couldn't yeah, use okay. performance counters to like diagnose L2 misses and hits in hot code. Because I can totally reorder loads and stores in hot code if I knew they were going to constantly miss an L2. But I can't get that information out of the performance counters at an acceptable cost. So I, I don't know that. Yeah, there was some article apparently that Cray one or something in 1970 had a one cycle performance counter and then every, everything's downhill from. <laughs> right, and Zool, like I said, Zool had a one one cycle performance counter thing. Yeah, we had the we had that on the uh, Cray XMP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a useful thing in the land of jitting where I'm going to have high call counts to your performance counters because I don't know what's hot and what's not, so I throw them in kind of generously. If they're cheap, I'll throw them more in. XX86 has been too much. Yeah, to some extent, if I have two CPU architectures and one of them's twice as fast, but the other one gives me better profiling tools over time, the ones with better profiling tools profile. will have faster programs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the other thing that X86 hasn't done that Azul did, I think is a huge win, is have, a, have an instruction to zero cache lines without fencing and, uh, and without... Uh, and all you do is confirm that there's zero, that the other CPUs don't have a copy of it. Because when you allocate memory, it's almost a 100% guarantee it's never in any other core and you want it and you don't care for the prior contents, you just want it zeroed in your L1 so you can immediately begin scribbling in it. And you want it coherent in a little while when you publish, not yet, across the cluster. So you want a delayed fencing and so Azul has a cache line zero Oops. and it has a memory fence zero. And the cache yeah. line zero did make sure that everyone else got rid of theirs, but it was optimized for the case where they didn't have one. Yeah, you and don't want your begin transaction to write the disk. Just, yeah. just the commit. Yeah, just right. the preparing. Yeah. You, you, you said, this line is mine and no one else has it and I'm going to put zeros in it. And I don't care what everyone else has, I'm gonna put zeros in it. And all you do is make sure everyone else evicts their line. It's gonna be, you know, from their point of view, it's gonna be modified, not in their cache. And so, you know, the, the, the cache coherency protocol totally optimized for the case where no one actually had the line because that was the 99.9% .9 case. And you got a free line in your L1 cache without taking the, the missed domain memory, no bandwidth. And that was a huge bandwidth reduction. So huge one third on a, on a busy x86 a busy sorry azul box doing complicated web servery things you got one third of your bandwidth removed by doing this hack it was a huge so what's the granularity bandwidth. on x86 what what forces the what forces the flush when you're just zeroing it so as soon as i say i want a line 
which I do by storing a zero into it because I can't have any other way to tell the x86 hardware that I want to touch this line. I, right. I write to it. He says, oh, you want the other bits that are on the same lines. And so I will pin the zero and start a transaction of memory to go fetch the rest of the line. And I'll put in the store buffer the zero. Then you wrote zero, 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 zero and completed the line, but you already stuck, shuffled off the main memory the, the fetch of the line. Now, when that line comes back from main memory, you burn bandwidth to get it, and it promptly he throws it away because you've already zeroed the line entirely out. Right? He, he does a, a, a mass merge of the, of the words on the line. All right. the lines from memory fail the mask, and they get thrown away. But he did the effort to so burn the, bandwidth. It's the, extra, it's the extra read you're trying to get rid of, not the extra I, write. Yeah, right. Right. Now, this assumes that your read memory bandwidth fights with your write memory bandwidth. It does, right? Bandwidth, it does. On which I don't think was on true the on the 8086 when they made this choice. It's true because no. DRAM is a bus. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's on every, every system on the planet. Read bandwidth fights write bandwidth. You go off chip and it goes to the same set of wires and you have to bottleneck somewhere. You have to do coherency between reads and writes. The so, more uh, like uh, recent x86 uh, Xeons, they have a like a special optimization where they uh, detect these uh, full writes and they, they don't do the read, but it only happens sometimes. It's not like a controllable. Not a hard guarantee. Yeah, I don't know what the rule on it is. Uh, so, for, for so tool, it, because we were zeroing line at a time, the mm -hmm. memory allocation for a standard, you know, hitting your T, T lab memory allocator just shoves zeros ahead of your allocation point enough to cover the round trip cost to get it coherent across the cluster. So I prefetched the zeros as coherency traffic to get it coherent. And then when I started writing, I knew I had a coherent, I did a memory fence of the zero of the line I'm about to write to, but I had prefetched zeros into it four cache lines ahead or whatever my, my prefetch ahead number was. And then- Interestingly, uh, DDR6 also adds some logic onto the, Onto the DIM as well, so at some point you would expect that the that the uh, yeah, the DIM's too late. Somebody went to the DIM that said, "That's interesting." I'm trying to figure out how it works because you, you go to the DIM and you say, "I want this line." The DIM says, "No, you don't," because you filled it with zeros. But right. it's too late. You already talked to the DIM. You went off chip. You know, as soon as you went off chip, you lost. Yeah, but at some point you could imagine that mem copy can be done on the DIM as opposed to bringing it across mm -hmm. the mem copy. Yes, pass. mem copy you could do on the chip, and that would be a win. Short mem, mem set, copies. mem copy, etc. Yeah. Yeah, short mem copies are actually really common and kind of stupidly expensive for amount of setup and teardown. At least like the cloud yeah. provider stuff, it's going in the opposite direction with encrypted memory. Then it's going to be hard to do this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it could even more expensive. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think the CPU vendors actually want that to remain in control of where the computation is happening. So they'll sell these memory encryption. Well, what, what Amazon's been doing more and more is just giving people entire servers instead of hosting more than one customer better, on yes. a server. Yeah, I just have lots don't and change lots. the granularity and then don't worry about the security problem. Yeah, well, you have a security firewall at the hardware level by saying you're not sharing across clients. Right. Yeah, and it I think those are 20, more for like cold boot or weirdness. Difference. What's that? Though, like the memory encryption, that's more for like cold boot, like an attack or some weird stuff. Apparently, if you like freeze the RAM as it's running, you, you, you can like take it out and then put it somewhere else and then try to read this stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's what all the Spectre and Meltdown attacks are look like. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go read your memory. Uh, I'll have to go sort it later to figure out what the hell I'm reading. I'll go read your memory. I got a lot of it now. Now what do I do with it? Well, okay. I go run some heuristics to try and tease out crypto keys. I will say, particularly as we get to a point where it's cheaper to have 50,000 RISC-V cores on a chip instead of four x86s, just give each customer their own chip for a fairly long time slice, like 40 seconds. Like, Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Oh, fine. I think uh, you're already hitting diminishing returns on core count with the existing chips. So I don't know if going yeah, super high is going to. Our chip has 512 cores uh, 
each of which has 512 processing elements. So but that's like a specialized domain. I mean, it, it's not going to run yeah. some random job. Really yeah. yeah. No, I think that the, the theory here is that your memory is not shared with any other client's memory. The same piece of memory is being shared between cross client. So it's not cores, it's memory. So you give him a private hardware because you're giving him a private chunk of memory. Now he can't yeah, run. But if I have a large number of cores, each of which only has one gig of the memory, you you want to prevent client one from using Spectre on client two's memory. Like like I, I'm a I'm a random hacker dude. I go to Amazon and say, give me lots and lots of cheap machines. I don't care wherever I want. And all I'm doing is I'm trying to use Spectre to go or Meltdown to go read the memory on my neighbors on the same box and i'm looking for their you know their bank crypto keys okay how does amazon fight this well maybe until they get fancy hardware that fights all the spectre meltdown they go to every client gets its own server oh most of the clients don't want very much server so i want the smallest possible separate piece of hardware that i can cheaply hand out to each client so i want the little box that's private memory and or you know something that says Spectre or Meltdown doesn't work across the you know the box boundaries. Maybe I can do it with one piece of hardware for which I have a Weenie Risk Five hooked up to some Weenie piece of memory, but it's all on the same die and it's all on the same motherboard because it's cheaper that way. But they're actually considered separate. They don't have any cross. There's no shared memory between the shared memory, or between the memory shared physically. They don't have a shared memory cross connect. And therefore, I can't run, you know, meltdown across that boundary. More and more cores memory. Yeah, whoever's writing the times is up to right? Throw down meltdown, specter, security. That's what we're actually talking about. So do we need to change our programming mm -hmm. languages at all if those are the architectures we're targeting or not really? Uh, it's not a programming language thing, right? If it's isolated at the hardware layer, it doesn't really matter what the language you use is. Because you can't rely on the right, but if I'm targeting a thousand cell processors, I may want to write my code differently than if I'm targeting two x eighty sixes. Yes, that was the Azul bug, by the way. The market wasn't prepared to handle thousand cheap ass cores. It wanted fast. Not so generally, generally speaking, there are no developers who can write safe concurrent code. So. You want you want to have you, you do parallel and not concurrent. So that's every GPU and graphics thingy on the planet is parallel, not concurrent. And but the code you write cannot be always cannot the code cannot be always parallel. Exactly. Well, that yeah, I think most server side code can be. Mm, no. Yeah, but the, really the problem is the problem is shared mutable. It's always shared mutable. That's the only mm. problem that exists in software. Like, and there will always be concurrency. Because... Well, there are, there are three problems. Shared mutable and off by one bugs. Yeah, exactly. So we'll just make it all in closure. Uh, no, that's a different. Well, that's time. that's a solution that starts by saying first slow down by tenfold. Mm -hmm. Now you had to go parallel because you got slow by tenfold, and the processors only got more, not faster. So you needed ten more processors. So now you're parallel, concurrent, and ten times slower. So you need ten times more processors. Yeah. This is actually yeah, the yeah. Azul bug, you know, the marketing bug was, yeah. hey, here we got 10x more processors, they're 10 times slower. Doing immutable has a lot of costs to it, but memory is getting cheaper, bandwidth is getting cheaper, CPU yeah. is getting cheaper, and the speed latency of light is, is not getting insane. cheaper. Latency is speed of light. So bandwidth is not, not the problem now, it's latency. And then, and then it turns into, you know, how do you get an army of ants to do the same thing that, a, you know, an ox does, right? That's the bug. Not all problems are immutable yeah. to have an uh, army of ants. Yeah. So, so, but it's always like, it's always going to be hybrid solutions where you get the best value, right? So like you have certain parts of the algo that you want it to be mutable, uh, efficiently using memory and try and sort of take advantage of your your processor architecture and you but but you only want to do that where you need to and then the the you know the long tail of your program where you're not running it that much it's not hot loop that stuff it should be immutable because it reduces bugs it uh 
well, it's, it, it's well, easier to write and the speed doesn't matter so much. It, 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 immutable, but also shared mutable, which is, you know, what Cam was saying, I totally agree with. If I got single threaded code, I'm writing single threaded code. And then, then I want my x86 ox or x86 cheetah to go run that code. And it's just single processor. Now, when I go to the, you know, I'm chomping down my terabyte of log file doing something and I have to go be, you know, concurrent somehow, parallel somehow. Now I want to get to the point where somehow I bring up the, if it's shared but immutable, then I can go get my thousand ants to go burn it down. Yeah. So, so I, um, the graph database that I wrote, I built it on this library called Bifurkin. And it's got this really nice uh, characteristic link. I've never seen. I'll put it, I'll put in the link. Um, uh, it, it basically, it's a data, it's a data structure library um, that you can toggle the data structures between what it calls forked and linear. And if you put the data structure linear, it means you're doing linear code and it's all mutable. Um, and if you uh, if you're doing uh, um, you know, and then you can say forked on the data structure, and it it uh, turns it into an immutable structure, and it um, copy you know, and write it, optimization. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not copy a... and write though. It actually has a diff uh, structure. It's it's kind of interesting. You can you can start out linear, or you can start out forked, and it acts a bit differently. What is the internal representation of this structure? Is it a, a graph? I'm bit? not sure, but uh, you can. It's kind of interesting because he's got a bunch of benchmarks where he compares it to other immutable data structure libraries and stuff, and it, it has pretty good performance. Uh, certainly, I did a bunch of data analysis using this, and I used to use a lot of Neo4j, which is a dedicated graph database, and this. I uh, was performing many orders of magnitude faster. <laughs> hmm. And um, so I thought it was kind of cool. So I, I built this whole closure library on top of it that turns its um, unlabeled graph store into a labeled multigraph, uh, or sorry, not multigraph, uh, like a directed uh, labeled graph, property graph. So, um, basically has all the uh, features, but um, yeah, it's kind of, it's pretty cool. I done a lot, a lot of graph database stuff. So I used all this for the, um, the graphs that I was doing as well. And it's kind of work in progress, but it's pretty cool. There's a second pan glass link going in. Why don't you write them near each other? Oh yeah, just cut and gloss. That's my uh, GitHub persona. I'll put them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. So. so yes. The the one thing I don't like about what I'm doing with peepholes is I don't have a very easy, simple, super uh, a, a way to do write the peepholes in a sort of more abstract way that also accounts for how far the peephole hunted for neighbors to make its decisions. Oh yeah. So I, I, it's all like Java code and has easy, you know, edge inputs one, two, three. If they have this and that, do your thing. So those are all simple, and those are all. Handled. I I came up with a great solution for this, and you're you should you're, you're welcome to think about it. Maybe you can steal it. Um, in the in firmer, I created, you know, there's a vertex object. And if you follow the edges out, you get an edge object, you go into the I next vertex edge or whatever. Objects on purpose, so I don't want the edge objects. But fine, yeah, so the edge objects are optional. So you can jump straight to the vertexes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so what I also created is a path vertex. And it has all the interface of a vertex. It is just a vertex, except it adds one thing, which is you can call it and it gives you the path that it's taken to get to itself. So basically, uh, and it actually gives you the reverse path so that you can build it, um, you can query it lazily mm -hmm. as a, like a linked list. Um, so, so basically it's the vertex, it has exactly the same interface. Um, so you can traverse 
out and get another one, you traverse out to it, you get to the next vertex. When that vertex is initialized, it's given a pointer to where it came from. And so that's the only difference from the vertex and the path vertex. And so it's really easy at any point when I'm traversing a graph, I just turn the vertices at that point into a path vertex. And then I keep on traversing exactly the same as I would. And it means that all my functions that use the vertices traversal functions are the same. And then when I get where I want to get, I can just call path and I see how I got there. And it's re really handy. Okay, so, so the issues for me are, I don't like allocating objects in general because of the obvious large performance hit that comes out of that. And yeah, well, that doesn't yeah. say that there's no way around this, it's just have to think it through. And yeah, so, I, it, so it, it could be native to the vertex. You wouldn't need to have a wrapper. So you could, it could be a flag that you turn this on or not, or, you know, you could just always have it because it's just the, one pointer, but it keeps all your vertices that you traversed in memory. So it has a cost. The, the, the other piece is that what I need to know is for a given pattern, how far afield he searches, because if I change those guys, if I have some other random unrelated guy and he mutates because some pattern mutated him, he needs to go backwards, declare as neighbors that go on the work list backwards, things that all other patterns, the union of all other patterns would have him search. And, and yeah, that's so, the part so that the, I have trouble main. So the wrapper thing was nice because I could have a path and I could be interested in that. And within that, I could actually put a path wrapper around my path wrapper and have some other path that I'm interested in, which is like a sub path of that. And I can like look at all the sub. So, so it turned out to be super flexible, <laughs> right? Like I, okay. I put the path wrapper on, I, I look at some path, sub path, but then like I get rid of it and I send out the wrapped vertex after I'm done with that, and then I'm back to you know normally a vertex, but I, if I will, thing underneath it was still was also a path, I I had that. Right. So. I will ponder. My my current implementation says something like, I'm at myself. I say, look at my input one. I got a node. I liked its pattern. Look at that guy's input two. I got a node. Look, I, I like its pattern. Look at that guy's input one again. And I had ding 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 up in the graph. I love this pattern. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to do a graph rewrite. Okay. That's easy to write. It has no local, it has no allocation. It's just local memory, jump, 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 three pointers removed. And I got the pattern I needed and I found it. The problem comes that on nodes that happen to be three removed from this pattern have to go backwards. If they change, they have to go backwards, backwards, backwards. You say all these guys have to go on the work list in case this forwards looking pattern triggers them. And that's been done by me manually. And I'm wanting to figure out a way to do it in an automated, but also reasonably efficient way. Like I went from some guy to a thing that had to be a, re a fee, to a thing that had to be a region, to a thing. And I said, great. So in the reverse direction, I want to say, starting from up here, go backwards. I'm looking for a fee. If I find one, I need to go backwards looking for a region. If I find one, you go backwards looking for an if or whatever the hell I started from. And if I find that, he needs to go on the work list. And, and getting those reverse paths automated was sort of, you know, like, like I, I would define a pattern as a circle I drew around the graph that I inspected, loved it, made a change. Well, getting the reverse path means I take all these patterns and I want to invert from the other edges and say, if you go into this, what could be this pattern? I don't know if it's a pattern yet, but it could be. I'm gonna go ding, 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 looking. Oh, hey, this looks like the right thing. Or I go ding one step or two steps and say nope, and then, you know, stop and go bother. And that's a thing that I'm trying to figure out. That that reverse direction is not well maintainable. The forward direction for firing the pattern off, pattern off, is well maintainable. It's easy to read. Yeah, easy. you just sort of drive drive around wherever you want to go in the forward Drive around direction. wherever you want to go. Yes, and you get an answer, or you don't, you stop, whatever. It's, it's, it's totally easy to write these patterns and deal. The reverse yeah. is how you get the incremental, fast incremental solution out. And that means I have to have the reverse pattern match as well, basically. And I, and I don't do the work I, in the reverse direction. I just throw you on the work list. But you, your, your reverse 
pattern match, you just want to, you want to see where you've come from, right? And then maybe do pattern matching also against those so that you know what you... And I can be... Yeah, so... I can so be... I, have, this, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have to be precise in reverse direction. I can find guys who are close and yeah. I'm not really certain, but it's close enough. As long as I catch them all, if I catch a few extra, eh, no care. If I don't catch statistically significant too many extras, I don't care. Yeah, so I have two approaches for that. So the, the first one is, well, one of them is the path thing that I was talking about. So like, you know, you you say, okay, I'm doing a pattern that that uh, I'm gonna need to look backwards on. So I wanna, you know, keep track of the path. And then when I'm gotten to somewhere where I might wanna look back, then I, I have that information and I can, you know, I can turn into a set and like set of things that I've seen and, or like maybe I want to go back a certain number of steps or whatever, it's all there in the path. Um, the other thing that I have is, it's more like the forward direction where I have what I call look ahead. And so look ahead is like just kind of a filter. And it's basically saying, um, you know, I traverse forward to some vertex and then when I'm at that vertex, I want to check that some pat pattern exists at some arbitrary distance away from it. So I do that inside a look ahead. It's like a kind of lamb. It's a you know it's implemented in a lambda, whatever. It doesn't matter, but it's a, you know it's basically it goes off and looks, and then the look ahead says as long as at the end of this path there's a vertex, then the look ahead must have passed. And then I just throw that away and I keep on traversing forward from where I started the look ahead. And if I don't, then I say, okay, this is this node is no this vertex is no good. So I'm filtered out. I, I do something very similar. Let me just see if I can find a good looking example of this. But keep talking or whatever. Yeah. Get some of my so so, but like uh, I've got a whole pile of like pretty interesting graph traversal stuff in the core library here. It's documented in terms of like function documentation, but I don't have much of a guide for this thing yet. But yeah, so it's all pretty clean. And if you know, ah. if you're curious about different graph traversals I've discovered over the past like eight years of doing graph stuff. Right. There. Okay, so here, here is uh, uh, here is the reverse direction, a sample bad, ugly reverse direction search. Get my glasses. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, code, but um, starts at a point that got that did something, and somebody else who got changed to. And I ask questions like, "Oh, here's here's indentation failure from oh yeah, who knows? All right, indentation failure. So the, the indentation's all wrong." But he says something happened that looked like a control flow graph. So look at your uses. Look for a region. If I find you, go throw you on a work list because I think that region might fold. Well, maybe you were a function node and the function was exactly this kind of thing, then go do that. Or maybe you were some parameter node, which is a fee node, and you're a specific parameter node after this thing. Oh, I found the return. And I, if I found it and I found it and I found it, then I threw something else on. So that's the kind of the reverse direction looks. They all look like test something for all users, test something for all users. If I loved you or hated you, throw it on a work list. Um, the indentation here is really ugly because somehow tabs got brutalized. All my env to gvn that add reduce. That's you know, like I'm thinking that maybe spaces would be better than tabs. Say the what? I think I didn't hear you, spaces camera. spaces would be better than tabs. I don't have any space uh, tabs in my code. The cut and paste from Emacs into Google Docs through tabs in where I only had spaces. I do not it understand. It really that brutalizes everything. the code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was not Amazing. anything that I did. I, I specifically say no tabs. My GitHub, my Emacs says no tabs. My IDE says no tabs. My my GitHub says and if you had Google tabs. Google says, Google no, says no tabs. tabs. No tabs, no tabs. <laughs> tabs. But I didn't. <laughs> There's someone at Google that wants to win the tabs versus spaces war. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh my God, I lived through those years. I'm, I'm so happy that they finally disappeared. I mean, I think they're still on. I guess the Linux crew has a very specific tab versus spaces 
but they have a large body of people who all mutually agree on how to deal with tabs and spaces. And everywhere else I've ever looked at or worked with, like tabs and spaces were stupid and I promptly like shut it down. No, no tabs. Do not have tabs. But, but, but I could do, no, no tabs. Yeah, someone's trying to tab now. And they, you don't have the, the four if pointer tabbed correctly somehow. It's a, it's a, it's a, if, oh, picked up a return. Uh, you, you, you blew this. Let's see if we can do this here. I'm fighting you back. Now I'm the, the irony is if you get everyone to agree on tabs, then you have to, then you have to get them to agree on how big a tab is. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I'm going with two. I don't care if you go with four. It's all fine. If you go with three, you have tabs you can pick, but everyone has to agree that you have tabs for indentation specifically and nowhere else. Fine. Ha, ah, no, no, stop now, Matt. No, no, no. <laughs> Jeez. <coughs> yeah, I can't. You know, you know, Google has all this problem with telling you to go bump to yourself. Ah, I heard tiny baby Aaron. <laughs> hey, Caleb. Welcome to fatherhood. Uh, yeah. So this is where the code I want. I don't like the, the I don't like to do maintenance on this code for obvious reasons. I want to find a better way to do maintenance on this code. And and uh, funny casts in funny places because this is shared between function headers and regions, which have the one inherits from the other, but the code is in the region because he does half of the work. And then there's cutouts for the function who does the other half, who could be in his own overloaded add flow def extra, and that would prevent having the cast to fun node. That would save me this. Oh, you this code predates sense. Lambda pattern matching because I, I usually fix those. So there's some junk uh, casts that he read of as well. Hmm. Simon has uh, some prog uh, progress from his language, but we'll have to see. Oh, he says have to drop out. Simon, time. you got to poke your nose up more and say, hey, hey, hey. Uh, I don't no worries, no worries. Ne I'm next not... time. Next but, time yeah, I'll start yeah. with you. It's been next time for like two, three weeks now. <laughs> No. So it's better do it's it next time, a, or you're gonna skip two more when I go off to Italy. Ah, true. No, it's not that important. Come, come uh, so give us a brief update before you drop. Tell us what mm. you what you're looking at. Yeah. Oh, um, give me a second. I just deleted, <laughs> uh, removed it again. You had a bunch of yeah. You were probably writing some code, and I don't see mm -hmm. it now. Mm. Um. Just make sure there's no tabs. <laughs> I... I don't find a text file anymore. Uh, let's let's just do it another time. It's it's uh, not that not that wild. We can talk about what I've been doing, which is uh, researching undefined behavior. Okay. Ooh. So oh, I, I have my my fun my funnest examples for undefined behavior, but you should go first. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I mean, I don't know. I mean, the the problem to me is like, what what do you do when you add like integer max and one? And so then like mm -hmm. you have like you have three choices: you can wrap, you can throw an error, or you can do what C and C plus plus do, which is say it's undefined behavior and your program is broken. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can saturate. I mean. It's always okay. Oh, yes, they're, they're saturating. I mean, that's uh, I consider that equivalent to racket. I, I would claim that the practical C, C plus plus answer is that your wrapped to two's complement, and it's not undefined. You just get the wrapped answer. No, no, no. This is signed integer arithmetic, and it's it's in the standard is undefined. Yes, the standard says it's undefined. Any implementation other than like Burroughs thirty six bit machines with ones complement math. Everyone else gives you two's complement. But in batch variable analysis, it, it is simpler to assume it's undefined if you would like to analyze for loops for optimization, because then you know the loop counter is never going to wrap around. So you know you will not revisit the same array element. In oh, loop. God, there's some horrible code in the C2 jet to handle wrapping ints that people write for loops that might wrap on. But I got it right, but fuck a hey, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so by by default, we chose to throw exception. 
All right. And so the thing that concerns me about throwing exceptions is that like there's this rumor. I, I haven't seen any actual code that benchmarks it, but there's a rumor that undefined behavior is faster. And so because like it lets the compiler do more. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Otherwise, for instance, undefined behavior is hilariously fast. Cameron said, <laughs> I threw an if test in after every ad. And that's it's undefinably fast. <laughs> so so as you know, Cliff, I don't actually have to put an if test in after every ad, but but you have the right idea. You know, if I if I if I have no other information, then yes, every ad would have to have an if. Yeah. Some guy comes up to you and says, for I equals M to N and I plus plus and then other random crappy shit in the code, I can make it even worse really quickly. And you don't know shit about M and N. You know, oh, M is, you know, negative and N is positive or whatever. You, you have to start doing weird things. There's other ones I, I got like, for I equals M, you know, minus a billion to zero. And then in the by the loop, I say array I plus a billion. And all these aren't constants. Of course, they're all like loop invariants. You had to go yes. deal with it symbolically, not not by looking at numbers. Yep. Understood. So, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I found Simon's update from the document history. If you want me to paste it in. No, no, no. Let Simon do it. Don't, don't. Okay. Well, it's, he, yeah. So that's he why said I was that it has. He deleted it, but. Yeah. You know, it's right here. If he wants me to put it back in, I can stick with that. Yeah, that's the correct answer. If he wants to put no. it back in, he's not no, here. Uh, no, and I, I'm, I was just oh, leaving. Oh, no worries. Leave it out. I, I just removed it again so that the people mm -hmm. who look at the document uh, after the video yeah. has been published okay. are not confused. Right. They don't have any context. So, so wait, that was kind of a speculative execution? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye, Simon. Bye. Bye. Okay. What's next? Well, well so I wasn't so, finished with undefined behavior. Oh, there's also okay. there's the Zig programming language, which you might have heard of. And so, yeah. like, so he has undefined behavior. He handles it in a very specific way. So basically, by default, everything throws an exception, and then you can mark like a function block as saying disable runtime checks. And, and then you, so like within that block, you get undefined behavior because it doesn't do any checks. So okay. anything that is, has a runtime check without handling its ex exception, it's undefined behavior. Basically, I mean, it, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you, you, have an if, you have an if condition, then throw exception, otherwise do the thing. And then if you take out the throw exception part, then you're, I mean, that's where you get the undefined behavior is you're, you're, you're doing something undefined instead of throwing the exception. So how is that hel helping? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how it's working out. I mean, he's he's put it in the language. I mean, but I don't. I haven't seen anyone using it in Zig because I mean, as and far as I can tell, Zig is undefined behavior defined this way. It says something happened. I don't know what, and the program crashed. How is that helping? Well, actually, what it does is it allows a developer who knows for a fact that they're not going to hit the under, they're not going to hit the edges. So they basically block it off and say, trust me, inside these curly braces, I accept undefined behavior because I've proven to myself beyond a reasonable doubt that it will not ever happen. So if the developer has to prove itself, then the comp compiler can figure it out, then? Uh, well, no. The compiler assumes that the undefined behavior will not happen and it can make changes uh, with that assumption. Yeah, we, that we, may yeah. or may not do what we you are, want if you are have, in fact wrong. <laughs> if I write a unique function that assumes that my input is sorted and that all the unique things will be next to each other, right. and you call it an unsorted list and rely upon the behavior, I don't feel bad if I break you by changing yeah, yeah. the behavior as what it does on an unsorted list. I told Another you example that was given was uh, like a, a graph algorithm that only work if you don't have a cycle. That yeah. is a kind of precondition that you would not necessarily expect the algorithm to check within itself, right? Because that takes extra space. So, so again, it boils down to who you trust. 
if the yeah. compiler can yes. can the function can has certain preconditions you must meet those preconditions before calling it and if you don't well something will happen in, in the academic world of course you know people want to believe that everything can rep be represented in the type system somehow so you have a type mm -hmm. called acyclic graph uh -huh. and then you spend the next 60 years you know trying uh -huh. to actually build a language that represents and proves such a thing I, so I we are there's, there's a different issue here and that's there's a language model and there's like a library layer there's a there's a there's a an execution engine for the language and an execution engine built over that for the library at the language level we can probably java shown that you can have strongly well defined all such behaviors or no undefined behaviors out of java per se scheduling across threads for multi writes or the few places you can get undefined out of java at the library layer if you don't meet the, for instance, the the, quant, the the correct behavior for equals and hash code, all of the hash libraries will all say, if you don't meet the contract for equals, you fail. And you won't break the language level, but hash table and hash map, they'll all just give you screwy answers. Within right. the language, you look at a language like, like or whatever, and the, you know, some of these languages actually try to prove things that you put in your library group, they would they would try to prove that at the language level. Yeah, I know some of the language level guys would do, but I think you should point out you can't you can't show cyclic or acyclic proofs at the compiler level in a general way. Ah. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. No more sun in my face. So generally, more more assumptions equals more checks. If you want to eliminate the more checks, you assume you want to go faster. So hence the undefined behavior. You but are undefined at the library level versus the language level. Mm -hmm. C does it at the language level, and and yeah. and as people point out, now you can get weird weirdy weirdy behavior out. Yeah. Java totally does it at the language at the library level, which a lot of folks you know. You want to complain, you want to put pre post conditions in, you want to do compile things, but can't cover all the cases. You got to assume. Oh, okay. So then there's another wrinkle, which is that, you know, at the assembly level, you actually don't have any undefined behavior. That's like, not true. That's not true. true. That's not true. Well, if you, there, so there's actually like a bugs. statement in the um, ARM reference manual. So they have a set, a, a subset of instructions. That have defined behavior if you concurrently modify it and the be and the instruction before and after the modification is part of that set otherwise they say any behavior that can be achieved through any sequence of in instructions at that privilege level can uh, uh, can occur so yeah so if you change like a jump to an add or something then something weird will happen but if you change like a halt to a jump then it has some defined behavior so even at that layer they can't I mean, fully so guarantee modified. everything Code. Like who is going to write self-modifying code? All JITs, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, way back in the day, I dealt with games that people tried to stop you from disassembling by writing self-modifying code. And then, you know, x86 had holes in its instruction set and the old proof bug was exactly, I'm going to break your security by running an instruction that's actually not really an instruction or half of an instruction is screwy, undefined behavior. And now let me break your security model at the assembly level so yeah when 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 hotspot does self-modifying code there are a ton of rules that we added to allow safe concurrent updating of code that varied by hardware platform to platform that we observed and, and or read manuals on what the rules were like x86 lied to its teeth for a couple of its rules and we caught them at it and eventually x86 came out with a much better Here's what self-modifying code actually does. Rule set, um, and that we could, you know, do a reasonable thing with iCache flushing and whatever to make it all happen correctly. But yeah, it happens at the assembly level all the time. Well, I mean, but the instructions are well defined. Like, I mean, the self-modifying proof was not well defined. The foof bug was not a well defined instruction. Well, that wasn't an instruction. It was an undocumented instruction. So, I mean, like the. But, Instructions of good but behavior. it was okay. If you look at the no, they still have undefined uh, stuff. If you cross a page boundary and the different pages have different write back or like write combining thing, 
there's some like section of the our manual that says it's undefined. <laughs> I, I'm, I bet X86 has weird things going on there. Too. Yeah. yeah. Like if you if you do a search for undefined in the Intel instruction manual, like the only thing that's undefined are the values of a few registers and flags after you execute. Okay, so so if I'm the guy writing the Intel instruction manual, one of the first things they do as a public relations effort is I hunt for the word undefined and I delete it. So a a grab well, over the, the word it. undefined. They use the word undefined on x86. So. So back to semantics. Windows, occasionally peeking the sun in over your shoulder, Alan, which completely has your camera wipe you out. Oh. So you go back and forth between being present and visible to being a completely black screen with a white dot. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Scooch a little bit to your right. Right. Like there you go. Black dot. I mean, white, black screen, white dot. <laughs> <Yes. Yeah>. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So anything else you want to want to say about undefined behavior here? Because there's lots of fun things to go on, and, and it, it, it definitely shit in the hardware. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking the throw exceptions is the right is the right semantics because you don't have to worry about you know anything. Who's oh, writing into chat here? This is probably Matt saying something about yes. Oh, there's the difference between unpredictable versus undefined. Oh, okay. And yeah, I have to go look that one up. So here's my my C example. You guys probably have seen this before. For uh, Print something, I don't care. Um, yeah, and, and not who just put ran. So basically, this program runs S1 some number of times, or it runs S2 some number of times, but it will never interleave S1 and S2. And in fact, if the compiler decides that he's going to initialize X, which is totally undefined, there's undefined, right? So C code's undefined. If he's going to initialize X to zero, he can get away with just jitting out code that says run S2 however long until your random triggers the end. Or he can say, I'm going to set X to pi or 17 and therefore run S1 forever in a loop. Or he's going to say, I'm going to fetch X from a random uninitialized stack value, which will either be zero or not. And then I'll either run S1 or S2. And I don't know which, but I'm going to make code for both. So in, in this case, because it's undefined, it is correct legal behavior for the JIT to say only compile S1 or only compile S2 or compile them both as an if test to pick, but it will happen only be once for each guy or whatever. So hmm. here's a case where undefined hits the JIT. In fact, this code hits specifically conditional constant propagation as an algorithm, which if you write naively, you will break yourself. You will hit the point where X is undefined, it's top going into the loop, it becomes top coming out of the loop, and it's all top, and you say no code runs, and the code never hits the exit point. Um, and it's, that's not the correct answer. And that's because you're feeding undefined into an algorithm which doesn't understand undefined. Um, so a naive implementation of conditional constant propagation here has to do something. The usual story is that when people convert this code as C text into an IR, they accidentally initialize X without thinking about it, either by fetching it from the contents of random stack slot or by just shoving a zero in because they didn't have anything else to shove in. Now that it's initialized, the CCP is good and it gives you a correct answer and you're done. Um, but if you don't, if you honor the undefined all the way into the IR from the C code, your conditional constant propagation algorithm will promptly choke on this. But because you have an entry point that says you are X, we are not nothing, you are not something yet. And uh, while you cannot figure out uh, what, what are the conditions, so you can speculatively assume. Right. The, the, the problem here is, is X is true or X is false according to the if test. 
So he promptly says, neither arm fires until until X picks up a value. Because neither arm fired, X did not pick up a value around the back edge. So you now have a stable solution. You've hit a fixed point where X is still undefined and neither arm executes. Hmm. That's what CCP does. Well, I mean, I, I think this is stupid. Like it's stupid to have uninitialized variables. Well, yeah. That, that yeah, was my that's statement. That's why some languages, they just I mean, auto initialize. Language, yeah. You literally yeah. cannot the, write. The, an the problem, yeah, the problem is there is a point in the program that you can enter without the, the variable not have a value yet. You're using an uninitialized variable, what are the semantics? Well, exactly, you're overflowing a positive number on a two's complement. So exactly. a good language. Thousand listed by the C. Oh, there's some good paper, good paper, good web page where guy lists C undefined behaviors. Um, let me stop share while I go hunt them up because I'll be flipping random pages up here. I found like, there's like a link on Git the, the GitHub site where like they list all the undefined behaviors, but that's just the standard, so I don't know. Okay. Well, I want it to not list them, but show what weird things happen to you. Here's a, a talk I think I've seen before that I thought was really fun um, on undefined behavior in C++. Well, so, the one to look for, and Matt probably has a link to it, is yeah, that to script, find a link. the script that you run that spits out a text file that you then feed into it. Like it's a, it's a thing that tells you how your C compiler is misbehaving. Not misbehaving, but uh, doing its own. It, it it basically tries to guess what the undefined behavior looks like for your compiler. Do you know what I'm talking uh, about, Matt? I I haven't seen that one. I, I've seen a guy give totally no, reasonable code moment. listing the undefined behaviors that are possible and promptly showing somebody's compiler who used the undefined behavior to go to town and totally emit the wrong answer out. But it was so what I'm talking about is this. There's a library, or it's a piece of code you get, yeah. yeah. and you feed it to a C compiler, and it spits out a text file when it's run. And then, and it's used by languages that cross compile to C, so they can, they then take that file, the output in that file, and it tells them what all the behavior is, so yes. that they can then, when they spit out a C code file, they can actually get, in theory, defined behavior from undefined behavior. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. I have I've not heard it, of this. I would I've like seen to it would a couple of times. It's, it's, it's an amazing project, which, you know, is wow. like, you know, many years old because it just keeps accreting new, new ideas. Uh, well, wow, new undefines and new language or new C compilers or something. Yeah, fine. Interesting. All right. But I can't remember the name. If you figure it out, uh, either text me or or we'll throw it into the doc here. Um, it I, I always make day. the docs unwritable after a little while. Like people can edit for a while, but then make them unwritable. So if you send me the link, I'll add it. I posted the uh, talk by somebody. So uh, he gives an example, like uh, when you're writing compression code, uh, <laughs> if you don't have this uh, signed behavior, it like generates weirdly bad code in comparison to what if you use. Yeah, a lot of codex. Yeah, yeah. Hit these kind of corner cases and I desperately would, depend on certain behaviors for their performance. I would say that arch nemesis of undefined behavior is the type system. Okay. That's basically the purpose. Well, I'm defining my my type system to have ints to be twos complement wrapping. Hmm. And if you uh, add one to a max int, it wraps. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's my what I'm thinking is that if you want performance, then you just use the hardware operation, which are defined. Like they're exactly. I mean, like, you listed all that's these one particular SMB answer that worked. But none of those apply to actual like straight line assembly code. <laughs> so here's a here's a link from Matt. I'm gonna throw it in the docs. So he's or he already got it in. No, I think he already got it in. Did you put that link in, Matt? Moving it from the chat. No, I'm fine. This is the talk I was looking for. I'm going to throw Matt's link from the, uh, oops, Google, stop that. What is going on? There it goes. Thank you. What's this other link? One of these was hysterical. 
I, I watched a talk that was really fun. And that might be the talk that just came around. Okay, here's the other. <laughs> All right, the second link's just as good. Just scroll down a little bit to see the the, the document. Let me find the let me put the link in. Hang on. No, 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 no. Ah, I lost my link. This guy shows here's some code, and here's the versions of GCC where it does something left versus right because it's undefined. So I get to go left versus right. <laughs> And, and then systematically approach the subject. So go and, you know, go in and be systematic about finding all the weird, weird corner cases. That was, that was. Yeah, because like, Apparently LLVM, like it's it's behavior on the majority of undefined behavior is it just inserts a trap instruction. Like the, ah. the, the undefined uh, word. Surely not for add one because that's too common. My favorite version was an old version of LLVM when you had a function which was supposed to return a value and you didn't have a return statement, it just fall through to the next function, which kind of made sense. If you think about this, <laughs> it just fell into the next function as it yeah. laid out the code. It, and, and, well, it didn't even emit re return instruction, so it just fell through to the next label, which was whatever the next function well, if was. You don't, if you don't want your function to drop into the next function, you should have put a break statement in. Hello. Well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. It's always fun to debug. <laughs> Whatever happened to like saying, you know, you, you're missing a return instruction here? Is that like a syntax bug? That Fine. would be too easy to debug. Fine. I worked on a TI mini computer many, many years ago doing doing Landsat data as an undergrad. Fine. And it had 994A? Uh, maybe. It was a box. It was a PDP 11 size box. You know, it was a refrigerator size box with uh, tape and all that. TI. It's a bigger one. And it, it, the, the implementation of the Fortran call instructions pushed the return in a, a fixed memory location. So no function could be recursive on any path because he had exactly one return. For every called function, you called that function, there was exactly one return. And, uh, you know, that's how he unwound by fetching that one piece of memory, uh, which was in the code, was basically next to the code. There was no stack in that way. And um, as soon as you wrote recursion, of course, you didn't catch it. You just overwrote the return address and started looping. And of course, being a young comp sci undergrad, I did recursive algorithms just randomly because, and I was, took me a long time to sort out what happened. I finally had to go ask some old school guy. For me, old school, and I'm like 20, so we're trying old school. And he was like, oh, yeah, there's just this one return. And they're like, there's no stack, there's no recursion. Like, oh. <laughs> is that undefined behavior then? Recursion is undefined behavior. No stack. No stack overflows. Yeah, why not? I, I guess you could actually have a, a version of a stack where you only get a stack when you do recursion, right? Like, yeah, but then the he, he stack thing would local... be gigantic. All his local variables were in static memory, no stack. Right. But you could have some, like, you could effectively do that. that, And then if you're mostly non, uh, mm, uh, non recursive, non then yeah. you, you just are looking at fixed places. Right. But then maybe there's a way of saying, oh, well, I'm recursive, recur I'm going recursive now. So I'm going to like switch to using a stack for a while. So you'd have to have like like these days, some time ago, in fact, that you know, x86 and everybody optimizes stack offset loads and stores and references in general. Yeah. So this would only be useful if you had direct memory access that was faster than stack access SP plus offset. That's all you know, highly optimized for yeah. SP plus small number offset. So that's actually what we have. <laughs> SP plus small number memory offset. Access faster than. Because okay. I have to, I have to fiddle a stack pointer before I can read this. I have to do gotcha. it as a fixed memory address. Right. Okay. So you have those right. fixed addresses scattered throughout your code as immediate literals. I could. 
Oh, well, you, you could, and if you do not, how do you do it instead? Well, you just have to do the stack pointer math every time you want to look at something, which okay. is annoying. Right. Right, so right. yeah, so end up end up having um, instead of a pointer to the current stack frame, I've got a little thing that bounces around, and the compiler just makes sure that when the stack frame is done, it's back to its original value, and meanwhile, it's pointing at whatever I read from the stack lit last or wrote to the stack last. Some standard so. stack like behavioral things. My yeah. uh, 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 spaghetti stacks basically. The, the TI I was on was doing essentially spaghetti stack, but you couldn't do it in, in fixed constant memory, constant offset memory. So no overlapping mm. stack threaded about. All right, are we reminiscing here? Is it time to, time to bail? Go get lunch for me. We are all done with like we, we are all over the map today. This is a pretty good talk. Alan, yeah, I can't find the script yeah. I was talking What's about. That? I was looking for it, but it's kind of like what Matt posted. <clears throat> Say again, I missed. I was saying I can't find the script I was talking about. Oh. The uh, the C code that, that basically spits out a, a file that tells you what the C compiler does weird. Sounds like, like something the, that somebody would write once they figured out they could write it. Yeah. Right. Interesting challenge. All right, challenge accepted. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, any anyone in closing comments here, or we're going to wrap it up till we meet again. Mm -hmm. I claim I'm definitely on next week, and I am definitely off the week after because I'm in Rome or Venice, and the week after I'm in I'm in. I think I'm heading for the airport. So yeah, two weeks missed. All right. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.